So uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about him, if you don't already know, about his fascinating career. He has served in many roles in academia, uh, from an English professor, a center director, a CIO of a university, a dean of an iSchool, uh, and now dean of libraries at UVA. I first got really interested in John and his background um, when I was working on an early version of my own PhD research, when I wanted to interview uh, what I consider two pioneers in the uh, digital scholarship space. And I consider John to be that. Uh, and his very early experience in creating postmodern culture, the journal, and some other things that he's probably going to talk about today. Uh, were very instrumental in forming the uh, foundation of a lot of the uh, field as we know it today. So I really don't know anyone that has a broader perspective or experience with this than John, uh, and I really wanted him to be our, our concluding speaker today. So over to you, John. Welcome. Thanks, Martin, and thanks everybody for staying. I'm just going to move this laptop and replace it with my own. <coughs> I don't have slides for you today, but if I did, I know which slide I would have. Um, are you all familiar with despair.com? <laughs> the, the demotivators? Um, they have demotivational posters. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, it is. It's a great website, and uh, one of their posters uh, is a picture of a ship sinking with its prow way up in the air and sinking in the middle of the ocean. You can't see anything else. And the big headline under the picture is mistakes, and under that it says, it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> You can look it up, it's out there. You can buy a copy and put that on your wall. Um, that, that's, my, that's my takeaway from, from life. So I'm going to talk about uh, an early example of tenure in the digital humanities. Um, in 1993, I was hired as a tenure track professor of English and as the first director for the institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities at the University of Virginia. In the fall of 1995, I presented my tenure portfolio to the English department online, and the URL for that is in the program if you want to follow along. Um, I, I actually refer to it privately as my tenure shrine. Um, <laughs> it's still up there, it's not linked to any, anywhere, so you are probably the only people who will have seen this in decades. Um, I, my tenure portfolio did not include a single authored monograph, and most of the materials that I presented were digital. Um, my case was supported by the English department, but went on to be tabled by the Promotion and Tenure Committee of the College of Arts and Sciences on the grounds that they weren't clear about the case I was making to be part of the English department. That led to a discussion about whether tenure without a department was a possibility, and whether I could leverage the general discomfort about my position to make IAF, my administrative home and research lab, into a faculty hiring and eventually degree granting entity. That was a tempting byway to the pit, which I ultimately rejected, uh, leading to a second round of outside review and a new college level committee, which concluded its work in June of 1996 by recommending my tenure to the provost. That's the short version of the story. I'm now going to tell you the longer version and talk about some of the things I learned from that process and then reflect a bit on what's changed in the last 23 years and, and leave time for questions. Uh, so I was, I think, without question, the first person to receive tenure in an American English department for digital humanities on the basis of a digital portfolio with no book. Uh, it's easy for the story of a first to adopt a heroic narrative about originality, go it aloneness, profit without honor in his own country, all that sort of thing. But when I look back at the record of this event, as preserved in my mid-1990s email, 
which I have ported from hard drive to hard drive and institution to institution. Uh, what I see instead is a narrative of the generosity of others and the importance of networks, not only professional, but also personal, emotional, and intellectual, and moral. And I should say up front that that network was nearly all male and nearly all white. I don't think I would be telling you the following story if I were a black woman. So this story of generosity begins not with my hiring in 1993, but actually in 1989, when I was a lecturer in a postdoc year at the University of Virginia, where I'd received my PhD in 1988 for a dissertation on American academic postmodernism. Uh, in 1989, Jerome McGann joined the faculty of the English department at UVA, and he asked to read my recently completed dissertation. No one does that. Uh, I gave it to him, and he read it, and we met to have lunch and talk about it, and at the end of lunch, I realized I'd left my wallet at home. So Jerry not only read my dissertation, but bought me lunch for the privilege, <laughs> and on the strength of that uh, start, I subsequently asked him to be one of the founding members of the editorial board for Postmodern Culture, which I co-founded with some junior colleagues in my first faculty job in the English department at NC State, and he agreed. And that was in 1990. And it was because we were working together on PMC that I learned from Jerry about the search for a director of the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities back at UVA. And it was publicly advertised, but I was not looking for jobs in my fourth year on the tenure track at NC State. I was looking at the job I had. But I applied, uh, and this begins the search chapter of the story. My understanding of the search that I entered into for the IAT directorship was that they had seen a number of more senior, famous, and tenured people and had no consensus candidate. Uh, so they went back to the well, and I was in the well. Um, I convinced them that I was worth a try, uh, but I came in without tenure, and I think that gave them kind of an out. If it didn't work out, I would be gone after a few years. Uh, in my estimation, coming into the job, part of my success as a new administrator with a tenure system faculty appointment was going to turn on the perception of my permanence. People couldn't think that they could wait me out. So uh, with that idea firmly in mind, um, I lobbied Pat Spax, who was then the chair of the English department, to be hired as a tenure-track associate professor, uh, something that's not unheard of, but it's usually used to bring someone in when they already have the rank of associate at another university and need to go through a local tenure review. It's not usually used in conjunction with a change of rank, uh, in my case from assistant to associate. Being hired this way was high risk because it meant that I had to come up in my third year when it would be up or out. Uh, Pat Spax, to her credit, did her best to persuade me to let them reset the tenure clock, but uh, I was stubborn and she relented. So, uh, after two full years at IATH, the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities, teaching half-time in the English department and being a half-time administrator of a startup institute, I spent the summer putting together my tenure portfolio and soliciting reviewers. The department also separately solicited others. Alan Liu, uh, then as now at UC Santa Barbara, uh, the late Richard Finneran, uh, then at University of Tennessee at Knoxville, Greg Ulmer at the University of Florida, and Pat O'Donnell, who was then at Purdue, and Robert Kolker from the University of Maryland were some of the people that I asked and who agreed to serve as reviewers if tapped by the English department and some of them were. Uh, these were people I knew because they'd accepted articles of mine for publication, or they'd been fellows with projects at IAF, or they worked in the field that was not yet called digital humanities. In August of 1995, I put my, my tenure portfolio up on the web, the brand new web, um, where it still is, preserved in amber, um, and told the department that I would not be submitting it in print because the nature of most of the work required it to be experienced online. In my research statement, I went straight at the elephant in the room. I wrote, my career as a researcher began, as most do, with the writing of my dissertation. This project was never conceived as, and never became, a book, 
but most of it did end up in print. The project of the dissertation was to define historically, economically, and sociologically the cultural context in which contemporary academic postmodern fiction was being produced. In investigating this phenomenon, I went on, I became interested in the subject of academic publishing and in publishing as a cultural force in general. I also acquired a long-term research interest in other forms of media and in the impact of emergent communication practices on the intellectual and aesthetic life of American society. These interests are foregrounded in the four articles I called for my dissertation, and at the time of their appearance, I believe they represented an unusually critical, detailed, and historicized look at the practices of literary postmodernism. And towards the end of that statement I wrote, research in the humanities usually takes the form of writing. I've done a good deal of that, and I expect to do more, much more, over the course of my career. But over the last five years, and in particular the last three, my research has taken a different form, that of building. I am very fortunate to have found two opportunities, each unique in its field, to pursue my early and sustained interest in the history, function, and culture of publishing, and to experiment with the practices that I study. In creating first postmodern culture and then the Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities, I feel I've made a contribution to the evolution of scholarship that is, quite frankly, more lasting and more significant than anything I've yet written. This claim that developing new methods for intellectual exchange is itself a form of research runs counter to a very old distinction between theory and practice. And further, it's made at a time when the question of whether technical work can have intellectual value is far from decided in our profession. Nonetheless, it seems to me that if research is defined as painstaking and sustained inquiry that aims to produce new knowledge and understanding, then the work I've undertaken at PMC and at the Institute, understood in the context of my own writing about scholarly publishing and the culture of the internet, must be seen as research. In other words, the case I was making was that IATH was my research lab, and its fellows were the subjects of my research. In retrospect, I'm surprised no one mentioned that I might want to run this by the Institutional Review, review Board. <laughs> but they didn't. Um, put more conventionally, I was arguing that things normally considered as service, editing and administration, had a research component in my case. The department's committee, chaired by David van der Meulen, took up my case in October and immediately requested further information about the research aspects of editing postmodern culture and running IATH. Some of the questions relayed to me from the committee by Pat Spax were naive enough to cause me concern, and I wrote Pat and said, when I was negotiating for the position as director of the institute, one of the considerations I asked for and received was a memo from Ray Nelson, who was the dean, a CC to you as head of the English department, guaranteeing that there would be people on the tenure committee qualified to evaluate electronic and non-traditional scholarship. The questions you are forwarding from the committee in particular, the question about editing electronic journal makes me wonder whether that memo has been overlooked. Mm -hmm. She assured me that two of the three committee members were widely conversant with information technology, and the questions came from the third. I replied with a long memo on the nature of my work at PMC and I, not quite 25 pages uh, <coughs> per topic, but it seemed like it at the time. Um, and uh, those became part of my tenure portfolio, added to the end of the sections on those two subjects. I won't bore you with all of what I wrote, but I was explaining things like how peer review worked in an online journal like Postmodern Culture, and what kind of work I did every day at IATH. In November of 1995, the department voted 22 to 2 in favor of my tenure and referred the case on to the college level committee. My understanding of the tenure review process developed not only from going through it, but also from overseeing it as a dean at Illinois is that each step is meant to provide an opportunity to protect the institution from the typical mistakes made at the previous level. So, because departments usually do make positive recommendations, the college committee is looking for cases that shouldn't be advanced further. And when you get to the campus level committee, that group is looking for bad negative decisions, especially where there's been some actionable problem with the process. So, sure enough, in February of 1996, my case was tabled by the college committee. As I was told by the dean, who was also a member of my department, uh, the committee couldn't really understand what someone who worked with computers was going to do in an English department, especially if that person one day lost interest in computers. <laughs> I, was, I was tempted to ask, 
when you hire medievalists, do you ask what they will do if they lose interest <laughs> in the medieval? <laughs> but I, I did not. Um, by the time I received that news, the college committee had disbanded, and this is where my process veered off the map into the unknown. I agonized, my wife despaired. Uh, this turn of events honestly very nearly cost me my marriage. I was told that people didn't want me to leave and asked whether I would consider tenure outside a department. I doubted that I was being invited to be a university professor, the only kind of tenured professor at the University of Virginia that doesn't have a departmental home. Uh, and these are usually people like, oh, Richard Rorty, say. Um, so I was pretty sure they weren't asking me to be that. Um, but I also knew that being part of a department was what protected tenured positions from being abolished. And my gut reaction was that it was not wise to allow the rules to be changed at the end of the game. So I reached out to a handful of friends whose judgment I trusted, uh, Jerry McGann, Willard McCarty, Bob Kolker at the University of Maryland, and my wife Maggie, and a few others. Bob and Willard thought that perhaps I could leverage the fact that the situation was uncomfortable for the university, and especially for the provost, whose job remember was to look for negative decisions with procedural problems. They thought it might be possible to argue for the creation of a new academic unit in humanities computing built out of IAP, where I would be the first faculty member. Interestingly, the evolution of a digital humanities center into a degree-granting academic program is what would happen some years later at King's College in London, Willard's home university, under the leadership of Harold Short. But Maggie thought this was all wildly wishful thinking, and Jerry agreed. He said, get tenure in English first for yourself, then work for the new Frankenstein monster. <laughs> the English department will kill itself slowly and agonizingly, and if you break away and form a unit that will be perceived as rivaling in any way the English department, you will be bombarded. And the armaments are powerful, for they are founded in current institutional inertias. Later, when I tried to launch an undergraduate informatics program at the University of Illinois, I was subjected to exactly this kind of bombardment from the College of Engineering for exactly the kinds of reasons that Jerry's talking about here. So I wrote back to Willard and Bob to say, uh, so far in this matter, it's been an operating principle of mine that tenure in a traditional department is, in some important sense, the point. If they make a special case for me, it seems to me to vitiate the precedent. I don't doubt that at some point there will be a Department of Humanities Computing, but in the interim, it seems to me that the traditional disciplines need to accept this kind of work as worthy of tenure if done well. Willard thought this was a bit prideful on my part and said so, and it probably was. Uh, but I went back to the dean and said, no thank you. I signed up for a tenure track position in English, and I would like that process to be completed. If the decision goes against me, I'll find something else to do. So another college level committee was convened in April of 1996, and a second round of external reviews was solicited, and the process continued until June of 1996, when the dean forwarded a positive recommendation on my tenure to the provost. In October of 1996, more than a year after the process began, and about six months after it would normally have concluded, the university's board of visitors made the outcome official, and I was tenured. So that's the longer version of the story. So what did I learn? Um, I learned that it takes a village to get tenure no matter what. Uh, there is always a network of mentors, colleagues, friends, and loved ones who urge you on, who testify on your behalf, and who shape your career in ways large and small. Uh, further, in my case, almost all of the work for which I was tenured was collaborative. I was asked, not unreasonably, to define my individual contributions, and I did. But the opportunity for those contributions wouldn't have existed without the work and the generosity of others. Uh, second, I learned that I preferred following my own interests and convictions to succeeding on other terms. At the end of the process, in early summer 1996, I was reconciled to the idea that I might very well not get tenure, and then I would no longer be able to be employed in any capacity at UVA after a year's grace period, according to the AAU rules. I thought if that happened, I would follow my interests in another professional context, probably in libraries or in publishing, 
possibly consulting with museums on digital cultural heritage online. Third, I learned that I am really stubborn, uh, <laughs> and also very lucky. Uh, but to return to something I said at the outset, I did not consider at the time how much of my luck had to, do, had to do with being a white male from an academic background. I grew up at Smith College as a faculty brat. Um, and what's different now? So, in some ways, not as much has changed as you might expect, given that 23 years have passed. Sensible PhD students of mine, like Matt Kirschenbaum, and sensible friends like Ted Underwood, produce books for tenure on top of doing far-reaching digital work. I still think it's fairly unusual to do what Andrew did at UNT and to go up for tenure in a humanities department with a digital portfolio. In spite of that, I think it's been demonstrated by now that digital humanities is not a career killer in the academy. On the contrary, many of those who were junior contributors to the field in the 1990s and early 2000s are now tenured faculty members in humanities departments. It's not always true, but often those who took risks to do something new and different appear to have been rewarded for that. One other thing that's different now <clears throat> is that the field of digital humanities is not as white and as male as humanities computing was, and that's a good thing. Broader participation in the work has brought more diverse and more critical perspectives to bear, and that's improved the quality of the work coming out of the field and enlivened the debates about the field. <clears throat> Ten years after the resolution of my tenure case, when I led the commission that produced the ACLS report on cyber infrastructure for the humanities and social sciences in 2006, it still seemed very necessary to say this. We might expect younger colleagues to use new technologies with greater fluency and ease, but with tenure at stake, they will also be more risk averse. There's a widely shared perception that academic departments in the humanities and the social sciences do not adequately reward innovation in digital form. A handful of recent examples provide exceptions to the norm, but in the most elite universities, traditional scholarly work in the form of the single authored printed book or article published by a university press or scholarly society is the currency of tenure and promotion. Work online or in new media, especially work involving collaboration, is not encouraged. Senior scholars now have both the opportunity and the responsibility to take certain risks, first among which is to condone risk taking in their junior colleagues and their graduate students, making sure that such endeavors are appropriately rewarded. A little more than 10 years on from that report, it seems to me now that at some places, and I would include UVA among these, digital scholarship is widely accepted in many departments. Collaborative work still needs to be documented and contributions explained, but I don't get the sense anymore that it is seen as something that's beyond the pale. The places that are slowest to change will always be the private universities at the top of the heap, the Ivies, basically, who have no organizational incentive to do things differently. What could be better than current state? Um, but in public research universities and in four-year undergraduate college, I see more and more interest in an activity in digital humanities. The hiring market for those with DH credentials is good, even if it's often pitched as a secondary specialization. So I do think things have changed, but in universities, and especially in the fundamentally conservative disciplines that make up the humanities, change is so slow that you could easily mistake it for stasis, <laughs> unless your frame of reference is measured in decades. I remember when we launched Postmodern Culture in 1990, we were convinced that it would completely change academic writing and scholarly journals in, at most, five years. Um, nearly 30 years on, that hasn't happened. Um, we might just need to give it a few more decades. Um, but still, even within that hermetic world of humanities journals, the digital humanities have changed what we write about, and they are in the process of changing what counts as an interesting research problem and changing what research methods look like. Thank you, and um, plenty of time for questions. So between the first time that you went up in front of the college committee and the second time, do you think it was just your persuasiveness that made the second committee 
brand new tenure, or did have changes happened in the way that they thought about um, the, the digital component of your work? Well, probably the most important thing was a second round of external reviews. So just stacking up more <coughs> evidence of the sort that you know does matter in in these cases. Um, but you know, second to that, I would say you know perhaps a conversation that I had with the dean, in which uh, I explained that although you know perhaps what I was doing wouldn't fit in every English department. In an English department that basically founded textual studies mm -hmm. and textual criticism, uh, that had a history of bibliography and history of the book as areas of strength and interest, that somebody who was working on publishing and on the impact of changes in the medium on you know, what scholarly communication looks like, boy, I, should, I belonged in that department. Right. Um, and I believe that, <laughs> you know, that helps too. Um, there was somebody I heard recently say, you know that feeling when you realize you're wrong? No, you don't, because nobody ever thinks they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know a feeling when somebody tells you you're wrong, or when you, you realize that somebody thinks you're wrong, but nobody thinks they're wrong. And I was quite sure I was right. So conviction might have helped, too. Yeah. And, um, so if you could... Not that you want to relive that experience, but if you could go back to the when you're putting together your portfolio, would you do anything differently? Oh my, uh, uh, some things. I I think I. The, the main thing was I should have listened to Pat's facts. Uh, there was nothing to lose really, in resetting the tenure clock and giving myself, you know, five or six years, of record there, um, you know, to, to build that record, and it would have been a stronger case. It wouldn't have been a different case, but it would have been a stronger version of the same case a few years later. I, you know, this is a good example of the I was sure I was right thing. You know, I was sure that I was right. That if I, my title was associate professor, that people would go like, oh, well, I guess we'll have to deal with them. Um, that was a, a bridge too far in terms of my reasoning. And, you know, I, I could have done my job at IF perfectly well without that. Um, so that's the main thing. You know, I think I would have taken longer. I wouldn't have made it such a high-risk gamble. I, I did that to myself. Yeah? So one of the things that I love in, in the talk you've just given is your emphasis at the beginning on networks and how important networks are for EPNT and for all, all sorts of other things. Um, and so the question that I have for you is, now that you are one of the more powerful players in the field, how are you using your network and how are you participating in other networks in order to get things forward at the field level? I do a boatload of tenure review cases, yeah. for, uh, <laughs> often for people I've never met. Um, so not just within network, um, but you know, for people who do work that I feel you know I'm qualified to comment on, that falls into this area. I'll turn them down if you know I really don't think that I'm the right person to review the case, um, but. You know, that, that's an important thing. And then, you know, cultivating opportunities for uh, people coming up to do interesting things. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I take no credit for uh, the creation of the Scholars Lab, but I now run the library that hosts the Scholars Lab, and their graduate praxis program is a great example, I think, of opening up opportunities at earlier points for people to engage in new research methods and and do innovative work. There are other uh, examples like this elsewhere. Uh, Rochester has a really interesting sort of mid-doc program that was part of the set of Mellon-funded uh, reconsiderations of the English PhD or the Humanities PhD, where you get some time after you finish coursework and before you start writing your dissertation to acquire the research methods that will help you actually you know, pursue your research question in the dissertation. That's a good model, I think. So, you know, looking for opportunities to uh, make it okay for people to take risks, basically. And then, you know, when asked to weigh in on the results. Yeah, Chip? Um, after, after you got uh, the tenure decision, 
did you have lingering effects of people analyzing how you got tenure and things that you tried to do subsequently after that? In other words, uh, was, it, was it open to the question of was it the same quality as other tenures? <laughs> Yeah, I would I would argue it was twice as good as your usual tenure. <laughs> I, got, I got way more reviewed, uh, and it took way longer. Um, that never has come up actually. Um, uh, tenure appears to be like immortality, it's a state without degree. Yeah. Yeah. This is more of a comment, but one of the themes I've seen across um, all the speakers today is that. Um, Faculty who are on the forefront of this work have to do twice the amount of work just in putting together their package, mm. right? So a tradi traditional, sorry, Terry, <laughs> traditional scholarship I get to just say, here's the book, here's the publisher, here's the whatever, it's submitted, I'm done. Whereas it sounds like Andrew and others have had to um, advocate and create new documents and create 25 page descriptions and go get twice the number of external reviewers and have extra meetings with the dean and even at six months added on to yours mm -hmm. and so that's something that i feel like um is something that the burden is being carried by the whether it's a community age scholar or a digital scholar or whatever the innovation is that they are being unfairly burdened and i think about um, folks who are also um, faculty of color or women in fields or men in fields who that are pre predominantly the other and sort of this um, sort of how, how many steps we how, how challenging we make it for someone to say I want I, this is who I am and of course I have to do this work because I think in this way and this is the research that I do and so I just I, I wonder are we going to get to a point where we say that's not your responsibility to do that that's really our responsibility as the committee members to figure out what it is that you're doing. Sure, we need to know your context and how to evaluate this. But I'm just struck by um, the exact wrong person is being asked to do all this stuff. We protect them from service in every other way, and then we double down on service of getting yourself tenure. So I don't know if you have any um, thoughts about that, if it's changed at all, or, or if that's just business as usual. I think that's you know, what you're describing will probably always be the case if you're doing something new and asking for a pre-existing process to uh, be adapted to that. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's a better thing to be asked to do some of that work than not to be allowed to do any of it. And, you know, the conversations that Andrew described, I think that's, that's kind of the best you could hope for really is to be at the table in the discussion, part of you know the argument, uh, face to face with your colleagues, and you know uh, making your case. Um, if you know if if we had chosen to do other kinds of things, we wouldn't have had that case to make. But you know we'd have had other challenges. Uh, you know I'm, I don't think I did more work for tenure than other people actually. Uh, I, I just think it was different, and a lot more of it was about the evaluation itself, and and you know how to understand what I was doing. But anytime you're, you know, you, you're not um, doing something that's immediately recognizable, I think that's gonna, you know, you, you probably should expect that. Um, how long we should expect that to go on is a good question. Like, it's 20 years long enough. Could we? Could we maybe you know have have a routine process now um, that you know it's more recognizable? I think at some point, yeah. Um, but I didn't I didn't feel put upon in in that way. And actually, I didn't feel you know although the the extended process was tortuous. Um, and you know if you just take all the stress that comes with tenure and then double it and then add a little more, um, you know it was it was. That was bad, but you know, I I did feel throughout the process that I was in a conversation, and that I wasn't, you know, sort of being held at arm's length mm -hmm. while other people decided my fate. I was given opportunities to, um, you know, talk back, mm -hmm. and I did. Yeah. Uh, so it, it seems like the. These troubles of you know going up and providing a new case to evaluate is a sense of self-reflection for the department. 
that they're having to go through with this one moment with this one person and requires them to really look and think about what they how they want to um, change or not change or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, do you sense that there's ever a, do you think it could happen without having that one person there to provide that um, motivation for the self-reflection, or could that be like a, an ongoing built-in process? Or is, I mean, are they exclusive? Or? Um, I, I doubt it would happen without the provocation of an actual case. You know, I, I certainly think once it's happened, at least in that department, the next time it happens, it's not as big a deal. And you know that you know not not every department learns from one department's experience, but one department usually learns from their own experience. And you know so that's some advance. Um, I don't I don't know I I think the the difficult thing is imagining something different than what you went through yourself. Really, and I've seen this with tenure, and also uh, in uh, PhD programs. But a really interesting experience I had at the University of Illinois when I was dean there, and th th this was a graduate school of library and information science, now called the School of Information. And like most professional schools, it drew people from lots of different disciplinary backgrounds because it wasn't organized on disciplinary principles; it was organized around problems, a certain set of problems that interested that profession. And we were revising the requirements for our PhD program at one point. And this usually amicable group of faculty were, you know, basically throwing things at each other across the table and accusing each other of bad faith because they didn't have the same mental model of a PhD program. And they thought, you know, well, how could you possibly say that? Everybody knows what a PhD program is like. It's like the one I went through. Uh, and, you know, when it, that was finally. When I finally figured out that's what was going on and put that on the table, it really changed the conversation. And then people could talk about, oh, what were the things that I liked about my PhD program and what were the things that I hated about my PhD program and how could we make a program of our own that has the things we like and not the things that we hated. And I think with tenure, you know, it's a similar thing. It's a, it's a deep and uh, prolonged rite of uh, affiliation. And, you know, when you've been through that, you tend to carry that as a as a model for what that process is supposed to be like, good and bad. And so, the, you know, in both of those fronts, I think it's it's really difficult without some specific provocation to you know step back from the model. Yeah. So the next step in the PNG process is moving from associate to full professor, and then. An earlier speaker touched on the exhaustion sometimes felt by those who finally reach that goal. And sometimes they'd like to change direction, yeah. but it's hard to do that. And so it just, it occurred to me that possibly those who are engaged in digital scholarship or um, transdisciplinary scholarship might even have an easier time with that because their networks are robust. They've spent a lot of time cultivating those partnerships. Do you think that's a oh, that's yeah. true? Yeah, very much so. And, you know, I think I saw a lot in both postmodern culture and in IAP of senior people who were interested in doing something different. And, you know, they had the luxury of making that choice. And they did. And, you know, with postmodern culture, we asked a bunch of senior famous people to be on the editorial board of this thing that, you know, there had never been one of these things before, an electronic journal that we were going to distribute by email. You know, really? Um, but we asked them, you know, people like like Jerry, like Bell Hooks, like you know, um, Greg Allman, lots of um, you know people who are very well known and senior in the field, and they all said yes. And then we started, you know, getting article submissions in, and they were all coming from senior famous people in the field. And I thought this is great, you know, they really like us. Uh, it was only later when I realized that if we didn't start getting things from junior untenured people. That was bad, you know, that, that we wouldn't actually last all that long once the novelty wore off. You know, if, if we weren't seen as a place where it was good to publish when you were publishing for tenure. And, you know, so I sp subsequently spent like the next 10 years explaining to English departments and tenure committees that uh, peer review was not a quality of paper, 
that peer review was a process that could be carried on uh, in any medium, really. And, uh, and, and later uh, learned at a conference for new literary history for Ralph Cohen's retirement at uh, UVA that, in fact, most humanities journals uh, do what we would call coder republishing. There is no peer review. And I was like, what? I spent 10 years explaining that our process was as good as this, and it's way better. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so it was um, not, uh, not obvious. Well, please join me in thanking John. Thank